and I'm going to introduce David. Uh, David Abel is a poet, an editor, an educator, and the proprietor of Passages Bookshop and Gallery. Three new books appeared in the latter half of 2017, Selected Durations, an artist book from Black Rock Press at the University of Nevada, Reno, and two chapbooks from Portland Publishers, 14 Eclipses, published by Couch Press, and uh, Sequitur Her, Apologies if I'm oh, sorry. Uh, with Sam Loman, he publishes the Airfoil Chatbook series. Since moving to Portland, David has published 25 issues of the free poetry and art broadside series on the globe, and devised more than 30 performance, film, theater, and intermedia projects, both solo and with a wide range of collaborators. In addition to curating regular changing exhibitions at passages, he organized the exhibition. Um, Sean or Jack? Checks. I forgot to check with you. <laughs> Jack Press, publishing poetics for the Pacific Northwest College of Art and object of poems for 23 San Diego. He is a founding member of the Spare Room Reading Series, now in its 16th year, and was an inaugural research fellow of the Center for Art and Environment of the Nevada Museum of Art. Please help me in welcoming this. Thank you, Betsy. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, everyone involved with uh, inviting me to be here. It's uh, really an honor. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, for uh, coming to listen to what I have to say. Um, what, I, what I plan to do is to um, basically let you eavesdrop on my thinking. It's not a formal presentation, it's more informal. And uh, um, I uh, have sort of divided what I plan to do into two parts. And um, the first part will primarily be my responses to the work. And the second part um, will primarily be a little more research-based and have more to do with the artist. Um, I want to begin by saying that uh, it's humbling to uh, speak to, about, with uh, someone's work. And I want to be clear that I'm not in any way speaking for them. Um, and, uh, and the work also, in some sense, speaks for itself. But um, I was thinking about this on the way over. Um, you can take that sort of sense of propriety a little too far because on that level, the world speaks for itself and doesn't need works of art, right? But in fact, we add those gestures, these things we make, as a, in the hopes of actually sort of amplifying experience. So uh, I'm thinking of what I'm doing in the same way. Um, so um, when, I, when I encountered this uh, artwork, which is... Uh, from Within, from the Containment series by John Outerbridge. Um, I, it, it is a recent gift to the museum this past year and was recently installed as part of a shift of uh, a number of pieces in this wing. And so I had never seen it before and I knew nothing about the artist at all. And what I want to do is uh, begin by responding and, and sort of sharing my responses from that perspective, from the perspective of simply seeing it and not, not knowing really anything about, about the artist. Um, and there are two, two aspects of the work that immediately engaged me and that I began thinking about. And the first was, let's call it form. Um, the shape and size and the, the literal physical dimension of the, of the piece um, and where it is, which is to say on a museum wall. Um, it's interesting to me that it's, um, it's about the size and essentially the shape of a small easel painting. Um, and 
being in a gallery full of paintings, that what that led to for me was to sort of bring expectations to it that I might bring to a painting. Um, I think that that's almost inevitable given that choice of the form or what you might call in a sort of manufacturing <coughs> sense the form factor, the size and shape of it. Um, and one of the things that um, I bring to uh, a painting like that is, is a, I guess an expectation uh, that it's in some sense a picture of something. I think that um, the question of in what way is it a picture of something, what is depicted, what might be depicted is, is, is interesting to me and engaged me immediately because of some of the ambiguity about that. Um, the, the notion of depiction, abstraction, and representation, even to narrow it down and say within modern European art, is uh, contested, complicated. Um, it seems to me as an artist that my, my experience with language and with other art is that there actually is no such thing as a completely non-representational work. Um, that even works that we think of or that some, uh, an artist presents as non-representational, that if nothing else, there is always the sense of their having been made. Um, so they come to you with the knowledge that, that someone has, has made this, and so if nothing else, there's an image of that activity. And uh, this is not an insight of mine. This is uh, very much a part of the discourse in the 60s with abstract expressionism and the notion that uh, what, among other things, what's represented in, in that Jackson Pollock painting, for example, is the energy, the activity, and then by association, all kinds of other uh, psychological, historic, and other uh, attributes that might come with a person doing that. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a vexing, and in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, question about what, what representation is and uh, what an image is or what's representational. There's a, a very interesting book by a literary critic and poet named Craig Dworkin who teaches at the University of Utah called No Medium. And it's a book in which he just explores all the, th all the works he could find that in some sense or another are blank or have no, seem to have no content. And then he explores all the different ways that he does find content, even in those works. Uh, famously, um, Robert Rauschenberg's erased de Kooning drawing or John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds, et cetera. So it's very, very interesting to pursue that. Not, this isn't a time, there isn't time to kind of go down that rabbit hole, but it's certainly something that's in the background for me when I look at a piece in which um, the notion of what is depicted is not uh, either self-evident or un, un uncomplicated. And I like that. I like working in, with a piece in terms of discovering what it might, might be doing. I don't exclusively like work that, that uh, asks that of me, but I do, I am drawn to that. So I was immediately drawn to that quality in, the, in this piece, that challenge, if you will. Um, the, um, the way in which at least in a, in a European tradition, painting, painting and drawing uh, presented itself as a mirror of nature or mirror or window um, is certainly something that's been um, uh, questioned and complicated in modern art. Um, and uh, the the second part of my response comes out of, out of that, which is the, the materials. So first, the first thing I was uh, uh, drawn to engage was the, the form, the way in which it uh, evoked a, uh, 
a painting practice or a painting tradition, uh, but wasn't a painting, at least not in the ordinary sense, and didn't have a picture in, in a simple sense. Um, and then uh, the, the actual materials that are used uh, take on a, a heightened uh, significance or uh, prominence. And uh, there's a preparation for that, certainly in a museum context, a historical museum context. Um, and that's uh, most immediately the introduction of collage in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, usually credited to, and some of you will know more about these things than I do, so forgive me <laughs> for these quick little historical notes, you know. Um, they, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to establish any points. Uh, I'm not a historian, but, uh, but, but certainly it's a familiar uh, kind of uh, narrative that um, Brock and Picasso before World War I in Paris in the middle of Cubism uh, begin collaging objects into their paintings. And uh, at the time it was noticed, but subsequently really became uh, a touchstone. Uh, and I wanted to read a short, a very short excerpt from a, a piece by the French poet uh, Apollinaire, William Apollinaire, who wrote a lot about the Cubists. He wrote about all kinds of art in uh, Paris. Uh, he wrote a lot of art journalism. And um, this is from a review in 1913 says, uh, he's referring to Pablo Picasso, he has questioned the universe severely. He has grown accustomed to the immense light of unfathomable spaces. At times, he has not hesitated to entrust real objects to the light. A two-penny song, a real postage stamp, a piece of newspaper, a piece of oil cloth imprinted with chair caning. The art of the painter could not add any pictorial element to the truth of these objects. Surprise laughs wildly in the purity of the light, and numbers and block letters insistently appear as pictorial elements, new in art, but long imbued with humanity. It is impossible to foresee all the possibilities, all the tendencies of an art so profound and painstaking. The object, either real or in trompe l'oeil, will doubtless be called upon to play an increasingly important role. It constitutes the internal frame of the painting, marking the limits of its depth, just as the frame marks its exterior limits. I'm going to be doing a lot of this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, objects, real objects, objects from everyday life presented as art, revolutionary, uh, at, least, at least within a certain context and a certain moment. Um, stepping outside of that, you can find precedents in other places and other times for the inclusion of objects in art for ceremonial purposes and, and various things. And that's also interesting and we'll come back around to that a little bit later, but, but it's sort of another topic. But, but I'm intrigued by the use of the objects and how uh, their character carries some of the function of illusionistic drawing in a, in a prior style of painting. So where, um, where a drawing of, of an object might have been, we have, an act, have actual objects, a strap, leather, uh, metal, and uh, one is uncertain, ceramic or wood, um, I think wood. Um, one of the things that about the objects that makes them so potent in this context is they have histories. Histories of manufacture, histories of use. They bear the signs of those histories, of how they've been handled which brings in aspects of everyday life and of social relations and all kinds of things. Um, traditional art materials have had their histories at least uh, dialed down, suppressed in a way. 
Because finally, every object has a history, so that all the pigments in a painting have, have a history, a material history too, but, but that's really not foregrounded. That does start to happen in an interesting way in the 20th century, with that questioning of things that have been assumed to be not, not important. Where, did the, where, where were those pigments mined, or et cetera? But, but in a traditional context, they're anonymous or they're blank in a certain way in the, so that they can then be the vehicle for some other kind of uh, presentation. Here, the materials are no longer uh, secondary or hidden or subservient entirely. They're, they're, they're very present and, 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 they, and they evoke histories and lives. Um, as an artist myself and as a, as a writer, this is particularly uh, a point of interest for me because of the very curious nature of words as objects. And words in some ways, in speech and in writing, um, are treated in the, the way that traditional art materials, materials are, which is to say that they don't really, their history is not present. It's merely their intention in that utterance. So all the words I've just used, we're not thinking about, well, what's the history of that word? And what's the history of that word? And what else, where else has that word been used? Uh, where else has that red been, you know, uh, used? Uh, but if one does actually focus on that in different ways, it can be very interesting. Um, and one way of doing that is, uh, historically, uh, in, through a kind of scholarship. So the writer C.S. Lewis, famous for his novel, Narnia novels, but also as a theologian. But one of his books uh, is called Studies in Words, and it's a wonderful book in which he traces the history through the English language of a single word, and then he does that for 10 or 12 different words. And there's a couple other books like that, and that's one way that words can sort of have their histories and the materiality of that history restored to them. But another way is in a kind of writing um, that foregrounds the sources of words in a way that maybe a collage or an assemblage does with materials. Um, a writer who I am inspired a great deal by, uh, Gertrude Stein, uh, worked very hard to restore a kind of materiality to words. And uh, connecting back to that question of whether it's possible to paint something or draw something or make an art object that has no representational content, um, there's the question of whether you can say something or write something that really has no meaning. And she's famous for saying that it's impossible. And she added, believe me, I've tried. <laughs> um, so I, I've... I've um, Oh, I, I forgot to say that, that uh, pretty much at the same time, very soon after the introduction of collage uh, in the early part of the 20th century, you had the introduction of the found object, uh, whether by itself, as Marcel Duchamp uh, would uh, famously present a, a urinal, a bottle rack, a bicycle wheel, uh, as what he called a ready-made uh, or uh, in groups of objects, uh, Dadaists and Surrealists uh, taking objects and introducing them exactly as they were found. Most of the objects in this piece, or at least a lot of them, have, have still been worked, that metal. Um, but a couple of the objects are really, at least one imagines, are more or less how they were found. So you have found object and, and collage. Well, in writing, there is a... a a practice or a, even a tradition of using found texts. Uh, and it's something I do, one of the things I do in my work. Uh, so I thought I'd read a, a, just a tiny uh, excerpt of one such piece that uh, maybe has some of the same effect with words. And this is a, a series of poems called Elysian Ellipses. Sorry? Yes, that, that's a, that a, was written actually for the wedding of, a, of friends, James Yeary and Laura Chunt. And uh, the subtitle is a, 
a semi-dis-Elizabethanization. <laughs> I'll just read the first two of a series of about 26. Let love love alters alteration. Looks, although love's fool, lips, sickles, love alters, loved. Let me the impediments, alters when, alteration, bends the remover, ever fixed, tempests, never shaken, the every be taken, cheeks bending, alters brief weeks, bears even the edge, be error, me never, ever loved. It's, it's directly derived from that famous sonnet of Shakespeare's, let, let, let me not admit to the marriage of true minds and impediment. Uh, and each of the poems in that entire sequence, in a, each one in a different way, takes words from that poem and only from that poem and creates new texts with them. So in some sense, those words are found objects. Um, in another sense, all our words are found objects because they all come to us from, except those few we make up as kind of a kind of nonsense. They come to us from other people. So, so I'm really drawn to something like this that takes objects and puts them together in a new way, undeniably still with the echoes of their history. Um, one of the many things that a gesture like that suggests is relationship. So when you acknowledge that these materials have come from somewhere that precedes you, it a little bit undermines a uh, kind of heroic, romantic, uh, individualistic sense of creation out of nothing by the artist who is uh, somehow uh, uh, given this uh, capacity that no one else has. I mean, which is not to say that I don't think that there is something very special about making art and artists, but th th that thing is a, if anything, an intensification of something we all do all the time. Um, maybe an intensification that's very difficult to sustain and, and admirable and laudable, but. Um, so in, 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 uh, in incorporating uh, real objects or objects, found objects, it's a funny kind of reversal of what painting has done with what's called trompe l'oeil, which means fool the eye, right? Where this, it looks so much like an object, but it's actually painted in here. You know, it first looks like a painting, or it seems like it ought to be a painting, but it's these actual objects, so it sort of turns on its head. Um, and certain kinds of illusionistic practice, which artists have explored with extraordinary virtuosity and skill. Um, famous uh, uh, sort of mythological anecdote about a Greek still life painter whose paintings were so realistic that birds tried to eat the grapes. And uh, so there, there are stories like that. Um, uh, that illusionistic uh, practice is not a precondition for something to be a work of art. Um, and um, with painting, one of the primary illusions is depth. And Apollinaire refers to that when he talks about those objects and how they set a kind of limit to depth. So they're kind of an internal frame in that dimension in the way that the external frame limits those dimensions. I, I want to mention also um, uh, so, again, without having yet learned really about John Outerbridge and his context, one of the things that uh, this work uh, 
connected to was a really well-established tradition of assemblage. And um, again, it's something that I think can be found in many places in many times, but within the sort of Euro, European, for lack of a better term, art tradition, it really comes into uh, uh, a great prominence in the mid-century, uh, following from collage and found objects. I think it's Dubuffet in the 50s who maybe first actually refers to a work of his as an assemblage and explicitly using the term in order not to say collage because he's honoring collage as being belonging to this earlier time. Um, but then in the 60s, it really becomes a label and a very large show is organized by a man named William Seitz in 1961 called The Art of Assemblage for MoMA in New York and it travels to California in 1962. And already there were a lot of people in California who were working in this vein as early as the 40s, uh, very much in the 50s and into the 60s and California becomes associated with assemblage in, a, in such a way that, that you have what's called a kind of California junk sculpture or California assemblage. In 1968, there's an exhibition called uh, Assemblage of California at um, uh, Irvine, organized by a man named John Copelands. And that has just five artists. And uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we can look and see that this show with five white male artists is maybe not the most representative uh, show of that tendency at, it, at its moment. But that's hindsight. And really just uh, by 1989, when a, a large show called 40 Years of California Assemblage takes place uh, at uh, UCLA, at the, the uh, I forget the name of the gallery, um, by that time you have a really much, much broader representation of men and women, of, of black artists, and uh, it's diverse. Uh, and uh, so assemblage uh, in, the, in this early sort of manifestation of it has a lot of, um, a lot of the hot, sort of heroic and romantic associations that I find a little ironic given the nature of the materials. And I think some of the artists probably found this ironic too. I'll read you just a, a, a paragraph from the, the acknowledgments for this John Copeland's show called Assemblage in California, works from the late 50s and early 60s. In California, the style known as assemblage is a covert art. It belongs to a small arcane group of underground artists who draw upon a common source of literary symbolic and visual metaphors which derived from a shared ambiance as well as a close personal friendship and empathy for one another. All the artists in this exhibition are social critics of extreme candor who compulsively mirror their reaction to contemporary society. Critical to their work is the employment of human detritus, discarded and worn out objects which replace the conventional use of oil paint and canvas. The iconography informing the work of these artists is very often oblique and can only be decoded by the inner circle. For the most part, the artists in this exhibition are more concerned with a lifestyle than with making works of art, though very obviously their end product is distinctly art. Their art tends to be biographical and is very often ephemeral in quality. Generally speaking, these artists refuse to compromise their art for the sake of permanence. I think um, It'll be interesting to reflect back on that after a, a, few, more, a few more comments. I wanted to read one more excerpt of uh, a text of my own that is uh, another example of lending a material weight to uh, individual words. Um, this is from a, a long piece called Times of Day which appears in this book, Float, which has three works in it that use collage in different ways. So it's in a way a, a, a concentrated compendium of my 
uh, immersion in collage over a period of time. And uh, so this third section of the book is called Times of Day. And I'll read a, a section from it. Gentleman, horse, cabin, head, each, chain, fall, coffee, box, case, socks, calendar, hot, heat, street, bed, camera, change, exchange, change, road, shirt, camp, bell, farmer, country, field, song, tired, singer, sing, capital, captain, face, character, coal, meat, expensive, race, letter, home, house, marry, almost, nearly, case, castle, 14, cause, dig, hunting, celebrate, supper, central, center, brush, near, by, pig, cherry, zero, close, shut, lock, basket, heaven, sky, science, scientist, hundred, certainly, certain, five, fifty, movie, ribbon, tape, belt, circus, circle, swan, city, citizen, clearly, clear, class, classroom, kind, club, kitchen, to cook, cook, car, rocket, tail, collect, college, anger, hang, hill, lay, color, begin, eat, merchant, trade, food, dinner, meal, beginning, start, as, since, how, comfortable, company, pity, fully, composition, shopping, buy, common, with, concert, contest, condition, lead, rabbit, agree, know, knowledge, get, advice, build, count, tell, watch, reply, continent, continue, against, control, conversation, cup, copy, heart, tie, chorus, crown, correct, runner, mail, post, run, stream, cut, polite, curtain, short, thing, crop, harvest, so, coast, to cost, cost, custom, create, grow, believe, cream, made, servant, cross, notebook, picture, square, which, when, how much, forty, fourth, quarter, room, bathroom, four, cover, 
to cover, cuckoo, spoon, knife, neck, bill, rope, leather, body, crow, cave, care, careful, mind, take care, culture, top, birthday, course. It's called Float. It's uh, one of the oh. book I published uh, about 2012, I think. So. Yeah, and that's a small part of it. <laughs> um, and I want to mention, uh, I'm going to continue, of course, but um, I have a few uh, books here that have to do with John Outerbridge and, and, and my own, which people are welcome to look at after. Um, so, um, those are all responses, uh, th thoughts, workings evoked by uh, encountering this piece in the gallery one day, uh, and, and, and then thinking about it and, and, and reading and looking. And um, uh, there are many, many things that one could say just from looking at it that I haven't begun to uh, comment on. And I mentioned the, the notion of art has a, a sort of mirror of nature and imitation. And you have an actual mirror in this work, which is one of the things that's very interesting to me about it. Um, what I want to do now, though, is I want to uh, give you a little bit of uh, what I've learned about John Outerbridge and some of the context of which the work comes. Um, and here again, I, I, I need to I need to make clear that I'm not, in any sense, speaking for the artist. Um, and uh, nonetheless, I found online uh, two oral histories with John Outerbridge. And one of them from 1973, which was done for the Archives of American Art, and another that was done in 1989 and 1990 for UCLA. The Archives of American Art is part of the Smithsonian. And they were very, very compelling. Um, the, the second one with UCLA consists of transcripts of 28 recording sessions over many months. Uh, the original version of the file that's online is 400 pages. Uh, I reformatted it for myself in about 225 pages, but it's very extensive. Uh, I'm going to be giving the links to those and also the actual files to the library here at the museum so that anyone who wants to, I mean, you could find them yourself online, but they'll be, it'll be that much easier. Uh, I really would encourage anyone who finds the work interesting to um, take a look at those. Uh, also, there are a number of interviews and lectures by John Outerbridge that are online on YouTube, which are fascinating and compelling and, and uh, um, so since uh, what I've done in this is to take excerpts from these oral histories and to uh, weave them together from the two different oral histories and edit them for the sake of time and uh, hopefully uh, I've done that in a respectful way and preserved uh, his voice but I'm not trying to ventriloquize or impersonate him either uh, but I do want to share some of that with you because I found it very compelling. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that there, there are a couple of things that, that show up in this. And uh, one of them is a, a, an alternate historical and uh, uh, kind of tradition and context out of which one can see and understand the work of assemblage uh, among black artists in Los Angeles, just for example, in the 60s. Uh, and another is um, the, uh, the impact, on the one hand, the impact of encountering the closed doors, discrimination, and racism uh, throughout an entire life in the South and then Chicago and Los Angeles, and then a way of thinking about those things and working as an artist that, uh, to me, remains so open 
and uh, was he black? he's black. He's very much alive, uh, and um, uh, with no illusions about uh, those relationships within society, but insistently not allowing the work to simply be collapsed into a product of that or, or, or only a response to that. So you know, going from the work itself, just as only as far as the label, one of the things you get is uh, um, that it's 1969 and uh, the title is From Within and it's from something called the Containment Series. Um, and I think sort of immediately containment has both positive and negative connotations. Uh, something that makes something manageable and also something that restricts and maybe even imprisons, right? So uh, most of this I'm going to read to you, although I'm going to, you know, be winging it a little bit. Um, and um, are we okay time-wise? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this won't be as long as the first half but I did want to share some of this with you. So John Outerbridge was born in Greenville, North Carolina in 1933, the son of John Ivory and Olivia Outerbridge. And he makes it very clear that his parents' uh, creativity as people uh, in general, but also specifically in, in various uh, artistic and other ways was crucial for him. And some, they were his first teachers and his first inspiration. His creativity was encouraged at an early age. He drew, made models, sang, sang very seriously in choirs, played music, etc. Four, he had four brothers and three sisters, and at least se several of, of whom also were artists, or are artists. My father was a man who always refused work for anyone else but himself. He devised a means of making a living by hauling things. He was a junk collector. He built things. He always owned trucks. He collected things. He moved people. He hauled everything. I think he was a, a junkster, in a way of speaking, simply because he corralled so many antiques and other elements that were stored in the backyard. It was a very attractive place for children because there were so many <coughs> toys around. When I was a kid, I built toys and sold them. I was a model airplane fanatic. I built very technical things just from watching my father. It was a place of energy. Until this day, I think that had some influence on my work mode as an artist. I like a great variety of materials, and I always go back to the time when there were all of these precious old things around me that I had a love for even then. His first year of college, he was at uh, Agricultural and Technical University in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, both then and later in Chicago, it's clear that uh, Educational choices were constrained by race, by, uh, by finances and other things. But uh, it was a good school. And uh, he went as an engineering student. He intended to be an artist, but he didn't have any expectation that he would make a living that way. He, in order to stay in school, he tried to enlist in the Air Force to get the GI Bill but he wasn't admitted because of the quota for blacks in the Air Force. So he enlisted in the Army and became an ammunition specialist. He was stationed in Germany, painted and drew uh, continuously, and he was encouraged by a cap captain who was a sort of an art connoisseur. I had enrolled as an engineering major because there were always those discussions about art not being very kind to your life as a profession. But I never saw it as a profession. To me, it's always been something that gave me an opportunity to be alone, that created some insight into myself that I could relate to other people around me. I was having a difficult time staying in school. The Korean conflict was at its peak. You'd read in the newspapers that the GI Bill might be cut off. When I went to A&T, I joined the Air Force ROTC. I had a keen interest in airplanes. I knew aerodynamics, and I was reading blueprints very effectively at that point. Structure was something that was part of my creative tendency because there were always problems to solve. I knew that in order to finish school, I was going to need to get that bill somehow, so I thought about joining the Air Force. After a year of college, I went down to volunteer for the Air Force. I took examinations and seemingly had every qualification in the world to become a pilot, which was what I wanted to be. 
but there was a quota for blacks in the Air Force. I passed the examinations, but I still couldn't get in because the quota was filled. So I went into the Army. Fortunately, I ended up in Germany rather than Korea. I became a munitions weapons specialist. That was kind of ironic, ironic, as angry as I was at not being able to get into the Air Force. To go into a military training situation that teaches you how to dismantle bombs and become an explosions expert, right? Intense training. Meaning that when I was discharged in 1955, if I'd wanted to assist the Panthers in blowing some things right, it could have been so easy. <laughs> in the meantime, I was painting in the barracks. I stacked up on watercolors. Germany is a very beautiful country. I, I managed to get a little car. I used to go to isolated villages and paint. I concentrated on learning the language. After a year and a half, I was speaking pretty fluent German. I started to sell a lot of little watercolors and things like that. And he tells some anecdotes about in some of these small villages, pretty incredulous locals seeing this black man painting who speaks German. <laughs> One day during inspection, the company commander, Captain Cook from New York, he was sort of an art connoisseur, rummaged through my locker. Oh, and the description of preparing for that inspection is pretty, pretty uh, hysterical. Uh, rummaged through my locker and found all these things. He said, hey, who did these? I said, well, I did, Captain. He became fond of them and bought about five. He said, have you been doing this all the time? I told him I had. He said, why don't you let me get you a studio on the post? He found space for me to work in. He set me up, gave me a Jeep, and I did assignments. I painted signs. I painted murals in American high schools. I started to paint large murals in officers' clubs, that kind of thing. So he was very lucky in finding this person who was uh, receptive. He gets out of the service, and he moves to Chicago enrolls in uh, art school at something called the American Academy of Art, which was primarily commercial art focused, but had also a fine art dimension. Going to school part-time um, and driving a bus for the Chicago Transit Authority. And he drove a bus for a very long time and uh, worked his way up pretty high in that. Uh, he also worked in machine shops. At that point, he began exhibiting work in galleries Primarily, the galleries devoted to black artists, and gallery, the first gallery exclusively devoted to black artists, certainly in Chicago, uh, a woman named Gail. Um, he and a few friends started a gallery, which lasted a couple of years. And then an anecdote illustrating the kinds of uh, uh, segregation within the art world at the, in Chicago at the time. He, something, he gets in his head to go to one of the Uptown Galleries, Michigan Avenue Galleries, to show them some work. He just kind of walks, makes an appointment and walks in with his paintings. This very wealthy man was sitting behind the desk with the person who owned the gallery. The gallery owner said to me, are you John Outerbridge? I said, yes, I am. And he said, you have an appointment. I'll be through here in a few minutes, and I'll see you if you could wait. So I waited, and I was glad to wait because it was so cold outside. I brought with me that morning the image of a crucifixion, it was about six feet, and it was a horizontal composition. The Christ was on a cross, and the cross was not vertically situated. It was laying on the ground. And he talks about a dog in the painting who's looking in. And I had some other paintings, and most of the paintings had black imagery. And by that, he's talking about images from his life and from his reminiscences of the old people in the community and other things. Finally, when I got a chance to talk to this man, he said, you can put that over there. He was sorting things out, and the crucifixion went way over there someplace, right out of the way. He didn't want to deal with that at all. Finally, he asked me, was I in school? And I told him that I was. He said, some of these are not bad. And I thanked him. He said, I might be able to do some business with you at times if you could change your images. Why do you paint all these Negro images? And I got a little disturbed. I wanted to say, why can't I paint them? And the ultimate discussion that was coming together was that if I could change some of the images in my composition to be compatible with what they could sell from the gallery, he might do some business with me. I was amazed, because this was a very high-level gallery. So I got angry, and I just loaded up my stuff and left and never went back to that gallery. He um, meets his wife-to-be in 1957. And uh, three years later, they get married. And then three years after that, they moved to Los Angeles. And it was partly because they didn't have children, and he didn't want to get too settled into something without seeing more of the country. He also had a friend who was going to LA, and 
hearing, he was hearing about how great it was and how you know, it was warm. And so they moved to LA in 63. And this is right before things blow up, uh, certainly in LA and in a lot of places in the mid 60s. Um, he worked in a production paint, he did a lot of different jobs, but he worked in a production painting studio that did very fine uh, commercial painting for architects and interior designers and others, and eventually was a, uh, managing that. And at a certain point, he also uh, was hired as an installer at the Pasadena Art Museum, now the Norton Simon. So he's painting in this production studio, and He's doing that all the time, and, and he says, well, I painted so much in that job environment, I found myself going home to my own work, and I was using some of the expedient techniques in my own work, and I didn't like that. I had always worked with three-dimensional elements anyway in model building, and I have a strong feeling for architectural gestures, just forms, so what I started to do in my studio were things that were more three-dimensional in their orientation. So he at that point had been painting his whole life. So he was a very, very highly skilled painter, painting and drawing, but he was painting all day. He didn't want to come home and paint, and he didn't like that he was find th these techniques were finding their way into his paintings. So he also had this connection to objects from model building, from his father. And part of the reason I'm telling you this is that um, sometimes when you read a little bit about him, um, it, it, the, the little capsule descriptions will make it seem like there were some other people doing assemblage, and he saw this sculptor, and so he started doing it. But there's all this rich background to him making these objects. So he begins making sculpture in earnest and assemblage. So I used to enjoy going to junkyards. Even in high school, I used to use my father's truck. My friends and I, we collected medals and sold medals, but some things you'd save and salvage. Noah Purifoy was the first person that I saw in California that was working in a similar way in terms of assemblage. I met him in one of the first exhibits in this community after the revolt of 1965, the Watts riots. I said, wow, that's unique. I'm coming into an area and here's a guy that uses materials kind of like I do, and that's exciting. So we got to be buddies. And then later on, I started to see some works by Betty Saar, who became a good friend. And these are both uh, black artists who've gotten, you know, a, maybe a little more, uh, well, they've all now gotten the kind of uh, attention that they deserve. I said, this is great, you meet people who have similar ways of thinking about composition, because I didn't really consider myself an assemblage artist. I just felt that this was the way that I liked to project. I found out that museums are strange places. I started to feel that museums were kind of tombs. Being a black artist, I'll never forget how hard we worked to hang the show that opened the new Pasadena Art Museum, called East Coast, West Coast. I think that show illustrated what had happened on the West Coast in art from 1944 to 1968, and what had happened on the East Coast from 1945 to 1969. It was a fantastic show. It really took a lot of work to install it. A lot did happen in California from 1944 through 1968, but nothing happened with black artists or with any black individual who was an artist, according to what was installed in that show. So not a single black artist in the show. So as, a, as a, a, an echo, as a strange echo of the list that I read from my book, I, I'd like to read another list. Maurice Burns, Shirley Stark, Alfred Hinton, Carol Byard, Bertrand Phillips, Valerie Maynard, Kermit Oliver, Trudell Obey, Otto Niels, Kay Brown, Alfred J. Smith, Jr., Ani Miller, Manuel Gomez, Miriam B. Francis, Emery Douglas, Rosalind Jeffries, Horathel Hall, Leo F. Twiggs, Dana Chandler, Buck Brown, Alonzo Davis, Bernie Casey, Dale Davis, Suzanne Jackson, Ruth Waddy, Milton Young, Samella Lewis, E.J. Montgomery, Charles White, Elliot Pinckney, Nate Forans, Charles Dixon, Archibald Motley, Jose Williams, Elliot Hunter, Moses Rowe, Andy Anderson, Alfred Jackson, Carl Gray, Juno Lewis, Curtis Tan, Bobby Gilmore, Tony Hill, Edward Bieberman, Robert Ames. 
I had never heard of any of these people. And these are all artists who either were part of this community that uh, John Outerbridge was very much part of in the 60s or in some cases were included in a, a book about black artists of the new generation that John Outerbridge was always, also included in. And I'm no expert. I still don't know a lot about these people, <laughs> these artists, but I think that maybe just even saying their names is important. Um, and maybe I'll learn more about them and maybe we'll all get a chance to see more of their work. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed through a few things. There's just lots and lots of great anecdotes about how he came to, to make the kind of work he did. But he becomes a teacher. He becomes the director of education at the Pasadena Museum for a while. And then he also teaches at Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is a, stool, a school that was specifically created uh, for students who, who could not afford or could not uh, manage the other state schools. It's right in central LA. I have a friend who teaches there now. And then he became involved with community art projects uh, as a teacher and administrator. First something called the Communicative Arts Academy in Compton in the 60s, and then the Watts Towers Art Center. And um, I don't know how many of you have been to Watts Towers. It's a pretty, pretty uh, impressive experience. But I didn't know until I went to Watts Towers that there's an art center there as well. It's not just the towers. And it's a very important uh, presence in that community. And he began as a volunteer, and then he taught there, and then he became the director. And he was director from 1976 to 1992, and devoted a long time to uh, community work in the arts. And it's apt um, to uh, insert a couple of very, very short quotes about Watts Towers uh, in this regard in a, a retrospective catalog, a John Outerbridge retrospective uh, from the 90s. Um, Leslie King Hammond writes that Shifra Goldman has suggested that for Outerbridge, as for other Los Angeles black artists, the roots of assemblage were not only the pop movement, but accumulative African religious art forms, as well as the Watts Towers of Simon Rodia, which were created from discarded materials. And then Henry Hopkins, in his introduction to the catalog, 40 Years of California Assemblage. And he's referring here to Walter Hopps, a really crucial person in uh, modern art in LA, whose uh, Sindel Studio and then Ferris Gallery uh, were uh, the first places that a lot of uh, pop art, minimalist art, uh, uh, California Assemblage art were shown in LA in the 50s. So Henry Hopkins says, Simon Rodia's wonderful towers in Watts were also important to us since they functioned as a mysterious community symbol of the power of the individual creative will. So meaningful were they for Walter Hopps that he and Shirley had been married beneath them. So um, he's working now in these sculptural forms and these assemblage forms. And he meets the sculptor Mark de Suvero, who sees what he's doing and thinks it's great. And he says, how are you doing this? And he find, de Suvero learns that Outerbridge is cutting all of this metal by hand. And de Suvero is going to Canada for do a commission. And he loans him his power tools for a year. And uh, in that year or year and a half, Outerbridge is able to make 56 pieces in this containment series because of this loan of these tools from de Suvero, who has a piece uh, on the next floor here. And that's referred to in the label. So he makes these containment series pieces. And uh, I think there's no doubt that one of the characters of containment in these pieces is the sense of, of limitation and constraint. Um, but I also think that the sense of power and concentration is equally present. Um, this one's called From Within. And that's a really beguiling title because what, with, what within? Is it from within the work, inside? Is it from within the artist? Is it from within the viewer, the objects themselves? After the containment series, he made this uh, very celebrated series called the Ragman series. And these pieces are very much dolls. And it came from watching his daughter play with dolls, and it came from uh, 
figurative traditions in Africa and elsewhere, and it came from his father's hauling. Um, then he made a whole series of works called Ethnic, Ethnic Heritage Groups, and a sub-series of those called Captive Image, where some of this sense of binding and constraint that you get in the containment series returns. And then, uh, not that, you know, 10 years ago or so, there was a, a series of pieces called Aesthetics of Urban Blight. And these are pieces that, again, look kind of like squares, like uh, uh, wall paintings. Um, and the sense of the street and architecture and graffiti and other things like that makes its way back in with a similar vocabulary. And that's not his whole output by any means, but that's a little arc of where he sort of has come through from the containment series. So to end, um, and then I, I think there'll be time for some questions, I hope. Um, great. Um, I, I want to read one more excerpt from the uh, oral history and uh, one more excerpt from this 40 Years of California Assemblage and end with a poem. This is Outer Bridge again. I always saw art as a way of communicating how the world is not and how it could be. I always thought that it could work that way and how it could challenge change. And for some strange reason, I always thought it might be a dynamic vehicle to clear yourself the way that we preach. It's like the way that we pray, so to speak. That's what art does for me. The period that I was impressed with for a long time was that French Impressionist period because of the attitude, because of difference, because they pulled away from the rigid influence of the academy. In other words, they looked for themselves and they went inside themselves. And not only did they do that as individuals, but they did that as a collective. And I think that, that collective, the salons of the Impressionists and uh, uh, breaking away from the academies, uh, really the beginning of what we inherit as an avant-garde. And I do believe that fine art, as we say, starts with our examination of purpose of being, things that we don't understand, to unravel the complexity of oneself, of the social lot, of the necessity to be whatever it is that is not quite right or that strives to be fit in some way. I've always thought that art was not about a painting necessarily. It's not about a piece so much as it is about the energy of process the dynamics of discovery, the vehicle that motivates the spirit, the apparatus that has us peering far beyond the parameter of what we know. Then in, in the catalog for the 40 years of California assemblage, Outer Bridge is one of the artists, and so there's a page for him. And the Andrea Liss writes the catalog entry, and she says, John Outer Bridge's assemblages are bound together by a complex and poignant weave of personal stories that double as historical scenarios. His captive image works from the Ethnic Heritage Group, 1978-82, quote, she's quoting Outerbridge, symbolically speak to a moment of history, unquote, which Outerbridge refuses to call, quote, the period of black slavery. Outerbridge astutely positions his startlingly powerful objects as memorials without limiting their homage to any finite event in history. His captive image assemblages re represent past struggles and continuing conflicts. However, Outerbridge approaches history itself as an assemblage, out of which he formulates an arrestingly affirmative philosophical outlook. As he wrote in 1982, the black artist will continue to use and reuse the untold tales to discover and rediscover the heritage route through visual means and through literary, musical, theatrical, and historical means, as old, new dances will signify a refusal to be dominated by some lone-sided aesthetic yardstick. The creating of an art type that belongs indigenously to its heritage and yet speaks of universal equivalence and the social phenomena of all life on Earth and beyond may someday assist with the establishment of man's most noble and purest deeds. So I think, um, I hope that John Outerbridge would uh, resonate with these uh, lines from the French poet Gérard de Nerval, mid-century, mid-19th century poet. And this poem is called Golden Lines. 
It's translated by Robert Duncan. Golden Lines begins with a quote from Pythagoras, the Greek uh, philosopher. What? Everything is sentient. Man, free thinker, do you believe yourself the one alone thinking in this world where life bursts forth in everything? Your free will disposes of the forces that you hold, but in all your counsels the universe is absent. Respect in the animal an active intellect. Each flower is a soul in nature bloomed forth. A mystery of love lies concealed in the metal. Everything is sentient. Everything has power over your being. Beware in the blind wall a gaze that watches you. To matter itself, a voice is inbound. Do not make it serve some impious use. Often in the obscure being dwells a hidden God, and like a nascent eye covered by its lids, a pure spirit grows beneath the skin of stones. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, I'm happy to entertain any questions, corrections, comments. Uh, I know that um, we're also going to be invited over to the to cafe. Well, I think you would have to look in different contexts. So there isn't simply one monolithic sort of recognition or academy, right? So I think that, um, uh, I think it's an, an excellent question. I think things, again, I'm not really a scholar of that period in LA, but I think that in the 80s, you have a real turn. You have an empowerment of various kinds of institutions. Um, and um, certain artists, uh, Noah Purifoy is one, Betty Saar is another uh, of his generation, black artists, begin to be shown in galleries and museums. Um, this sh a show like 40 Years of California Assemblage is more inclusive. Um, I think that it, it, uh, it builds, certainly, from then, and more in the 90s, and more in the... One thing that happens is that the simple fact of historical distance, so that a period like the 50s and 60s is much more uh, closely scrutinized and a lot more attention is paid to other than just the most well-known uh, figures, you know? Uh, but that's, that's an excellent question. I don't really, uh, I can't answer it in great detail. I'm curious about but this series is 57 pieces, something like that? Something like that, yeah. Audience. Well, and, and, and many of them did find their way into good collections, although pro probably primarily at that time, they were collections of, of really more uh, either visionary or just uh, people with a connoisseurship that was not uh, narrow, you know, who were looking outside of what was already being uh, sort of celebrated to look for work that, that wasn't as well known. And so there were galleries, you know, even in Chicago there were galleries and there was a, a pioneering museum of African art, African American art in Chicago in the 50s, 60s, a woman named Margaret Burroughs started. So you do have some outlet, but it's just that it's, it's quite limited uh, in, that, in the 60s, certainly, and the 70s, and then it really starts to change. And, and you also, of course, have um, criticism, both his, you know, historic, historical criticism and even contemporary criticism, that starts to look at liber liberatory movements, starts to look at uh, feminism, starts to look at uh, gay liberation, queer theory, things like that, all of which uh, make it a little harder for, I mean, not that you don't still have plenty of institutions that <laughs> don't open their doors, but it makes it harder and m many more institutions start to you know, embrace more. But I'm sorry, I hope that answers at least a little bit, yeah. It makes me want to read more about what he was doing. Me too. Posting, yeah. Uh, those yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I will say that um, it was very hard to find the retrospective catalog, which was published by the Afro-American Afro Museum, Museum of Afro-American Art and Culture in Los Angeles. The only copy in Portland is at PSU, 
and I had a friend who teaches there who I could check it out from. There's no copies for sale online. I mean, that's a, now there's a lot of books that are hard to find, and it's not simply because he's a black artist, but it's a retrospective. It ought to be more, more accessible, you know? Um, but I am happy that uh, it's certainly a case where something like social media, YouTube, uh, really makes it possible to, to have access. Sure, sure. Any, any other questions now? Thanks so much for your patience. And uh, let's uh, head over to the cafe. <laughs> Thank you.